hustlers, road players, tournament champions. Hear the stories, get their advice, learn about their lives. Our host, Joey Ryan, brings you an inside look at the professional pool player. You're listening to the Pool Player Podcast, brought to you by Pool Scene 365. Hey guys, Joey Ryan here, Pool Player Podcast, brought to you by Pool Scene 365. We have a great episode for you. Uh, Today we have really one of the most consistent players over a number of decades. He's a two-time world champion. He's won the Derby City Nine Ball uh, three times. He's a six-time world pool masters champion. He's won a gold medal in the world games and just an incredibly consistent player Uh, always finding him on the Moscone Cup, winning a number of Moscone Cups, it's Ralph Souquet. I was able to catch up with Ralph and we had the time difference because he's in Germany, but he was so great about it. We had an awesome conversation and we went through a number of different things throughout his pool career, including how he got started and some advice that he may have for some players out there and really how he maintains his composure and his cool even when he's facing adversity in a match and and why he thinks that's important for a pool player. So guys, thanks so much for the support. Once again, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe to the channel. That's the biggest thing you can do to help me out. Also, you can hit up my Patreon. I wanna give a shout out to Corby Dayhoff, uh, Patreon supporter. Thanks so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Also guys, I have a PayPal link if you want to donate to the channel. Everything I earn from this will go right back into the channel. Better equipment, technology, I don't know if you noticed, but right now I'm using a little lapel mic. Testing this out as wireless uh, because I want to do some on-site interviews. I'm going to be in Las Vegas over the weekend. I'm going to be traveling to different places. And so I want to keep improving the technology and improving the product that I'm providing to you. So guys, thanks so much for watching and now, Ralph Suke. Hey, Ralph. Thanks so much for joining the uh, podcast today. I really appreciate it. Hey, Joey. Thanks for having me on the show. Sure, sure. I'm really excited. You're, you've been one of my favorite players for a really long time, and I'm excited to learn more about you. So tell me, how did you get your start playing pool? Um, well, I basically started in my parents' pub when I was six years old. So we have to go back to... 74, 75, when they you know, just had opened up the, the business there. And uh, they had a small pool table. I can't really remember the size of it. It was definitely not a nine-foot table. So it, it might have been uh, six foot, seven, seven and a half, somewhere in, in that range. And, uh, yeah, my dad started playing there. And uh, I was so fascinated by all those colored balls that I, you know, really got into it really quickly and uh, and of course you know when you can hang out in a pub with uh, you know a lot of other adults or with a lot of adults you know then uh, that's that's something really fun even at a young age it's of six was there something about the game you know i i i hear from some players that they saw their ver- first draw shot and somebody hit with backspin or was there something like that about the game that just had you hooked instantly not really, because, you know, I mean, back then, you know, I think nobody even knew about stop shot, draw shot. It was more like, you know, hitting that fat cue ball. The cue ball was like much bigger than, than the object balls because it, it had a an iron or I don't know if it had a, a magnet or, or the iron. I think it, it had a, an iron core so that the cue ball basically came out all the time. And so it was really, really tough, you know, to even think about a draw shot there because the cue ball basically automatically ran through the object ball because it was so much heavier and and so much uh, bigger than the object ball. Yeah, I remember playing with those big balls and man, it was so tough. It, It was actually a different game because the it just reacted so much different when it hit the other balls. So it was kind of interesting playing with that big cue ball. Was there a moment that you realized that, hey, I could be really good at this. Maybe this is something that I could do uh, for a career? Well, obviously at a young age, I never even thought about it. You know, And it was never ever a goal of, of myself to become a professional because again, you know, when I, when I try to remember back, uh, 
I didn't even know that there were players playing professionally because it just didn't exist, not in Germany, not in Europe. It was, you know, and there was no internet, no Facebook, no YouTube or anything that you can check things out. You know, it was just, you know, me and, and the guests and, and my dad in, in our pub and we played around and uh, I got better obviously every day because I practice every day. Or I shouldn't say practice, I played every day. You know, I think practicing started way, way later when, uh, you know, when I when I actually had already played in, in some competition, but it, it, it was not really uh, a goal or something that I had in mind. You know, it was just for the fun of it and uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I basically grew into it and it, you know, at, at one stage later on, when our pub was already closed, I moved to a different club. And then I had actually, I, I smell first blood because now uh, I, you know, started to play in, against better players. And I was uh, basically put into the German Bundesliga for the very first time at the age of 14. And uh, so now, again, you know, everything was uh, new for me. And uh, I was by far, you know, not even close to the top players. You know, back then, we mainly played straight pool. So I really had to, to fight and, and put myself, you know, in the limelight and, and try to beat those players first. And, uh, and from there on, you know, things became... You know, better and then I got more successful. I won my first uh, German uh, championship title that was still in the pupils division. And, uh, and you know, after that, I played in the juniors division for several years. And but and even at, at this point, you know, I didn't even think about a professional career yet. So I saw the old video, it was, I think it was an AccuStats video where you must have just come to the United States. You had a mustache. And I want to say that you played maybe Steve Miserak or somebody in a tournament. And there was a post-match interview. And in that interview, it just seemed like, uh, I don't want to say it was Miserak in case it wasn't, but if it was him, uh, it just seemed like the way he was talking about not just you, but Europeans in general coming over to the United States, there there was kind of a lack of respect there, kind of like, you know, these Europeans, yeah, they play okay, but they're not going to, you know, do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, did you experience that when you first came over to the United States? What was that like? Tell us about that transition. Um, I personally <clears throat> did not make that. Um, I didn't have that impression, to be honest. Obviously, um, my first event in the US was back in 89. I played at the BC Open in Binghamton in the state of New York. And that might have been the event where I played Steve Miserec. That's uh, very possible. And I think, I don't know if it was the same year or the year before. It might have been the same year that uh, Oliver Orman uh, actually beat Steve Miserec in the US Open straight pole. And uh, so maybe it was because of this that he was a little upset that he got beat in the finals of the US Open by a European player that played absolutely a different style of straight pull than uh, any other American. Uh, they've probably seen a new world of, of straight pull back then. Um, but obviously, uh, yeah, that was uh, one big step for yeah, a European player to win such a big title, even though there were other players uh, like Norbert Lang. I think he played already in the US in 87. And, uh, but he played in the juniors division. So maybe not everyone got really, got a lot uh, to see of him. Yeah. But I, I never felt that there was uh, no respect for me. Maybe there was when they were maybe talking to each other, but uh, you know, they never obviously told me anything about it. So, uh, and if so, yeah, that, that's the way it is, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned something that I'd like to follow up about. You said that the European players were playing a different type of straight pool than the American players. And you've had some fabulous uh, players, you know, straight pool players come out of Germany, you know, yourself, you've had uh, uh, Ralph Eckert, um, uh, Thorsten Holman. I mean, just 
one after the next. So what is that different style that you're referring to? Well, I think when I first came over, I visited Jim Rempe at his home for like a week. So we, we practiced a bit together because uh, him and I, we have the same sponsor. It's the fight group uh, based near Hamburg, Germany. And uh, so Jim always came over to the European trade show or to the German trade show in Essen. And uh, so he, he owed the sponsor a favor. And uh, so the, the sponsor at some point asked if, if I could visit him at home and, and, you know, if he could spend a few days with me working on, on my game. And so, yeah, it was a done deal. So I flew over. That was right before the, um, the BC Open in Binghamton. And, uh, of course, I had seen Jimmy before, and but I, I never really uh, checked out his triple game a lot, to be honest, because it was the time when nine ball basically just started to to pop out, to came on the market. So I, I had more focus on, on the nine ball game already, and uh, but you know spending time at, at his house, and uh, I saw <clears throat> I saw that uh, their or his triple game is uh, more like you know picking out balls after the break shots, not hitting the break shot so hard, you know, have a medium soft break shots, try to, you know, bring three, four balls out of the, out of the stack and, and go from there and break him again and break him again, basically, you know, and the European style is like hit the break shot hard and basically try to open up the whole stack and, and, and don't uh, have too many, you know, clusters and, and problems around already after the break shot. And that's, I think, the, the main difference uh, of playing or of watching European or American players playing straight ball. Yeah, that's interesting. I I never really thought about it that way, but I, I, I think that's kind of an interesting observation. So, uh, you know, we have uh, John Schmidt over here that just broke the world record for running 626 consecutive balls. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm sure you've heard about it. What are your thoughts on breaking that world record? It's just an amazing run. It's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, my personal high run is 285, which I'm, you know, quite proud of. But mm -hmm. uh, I know that there are so many players out there that, that ran 300 plus, some of them 400, like Thorsten Norman. And then you have John Schmidt, who is with his... Uh, 626 uh, <clears throat> completely out of range <clears throat> in my opinion and uh, yeah I mean it's 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 unbelievable it doesn't really matter how how big the pockets were I mean you know we have people on, on the social media talking about it yeah the pockets were so big but but still you know I mean try it yourself and, and try to run that many balls and uh, and he plays such a, a nice straight ball game like a typical American way again you know when, when I compare him to Thorsten's straight pull, they're totally different worlds. But uh, but they're both great straight pull players, you know. So it's it's just a different style, and uh, I probably could never run that many balls. Maybe I'm I'm getting older. It might be one reason, but it's it's so tough to to hang in there that long to keep the concentration up. So it's it's really super difficult, in my opinion. So you mentioned Jim Rempe and spending some time with him. Who were the players when you were coming up that you kind of looked up to or, or kind of tried to model your game after? Anyone? Um, I never really had a player that I that I was looking up to because I, I tried to watch all the better players, and there were lots of them <laughs> back in the days. And I tried to pick you know a little bit of each player and uh, try to implement it into my own game and uh, because it, at the end you need to find your own rhythm your own game because if you try to copy someone it's not going to work you know so um, but of course I mean back then you had Steve Miserec you had Mike Siegel you had Nick Varner Jim Rempe Earl was already around also but more in in, in nine ball obviously you know, he was never really a big straight ball player and uh and I'm probably going to forget, you know, a ton of other players that were really top-notch players back then. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, when 
in my first tournaments, I, I try to watch as many games as possible from all the other players. And, uh, and I always realized when I was back home in Germany, I, I had changed something in my style, but not that I wanted that change. It just happened. You know, I, I just watched them. And uh, for some reason, it's, I implemented new things into my game, into my style. And, and I, yeah, I started using it. You know, I never really tried to copy anyone's style. It, it just happened overnight, basically. Yeah. So was there, a, like, if you think back to the beginning, was there a professional event where maybe you upset some people and surprised yourself and said, oh, now I've arrived. I am a professional pool player. Can you think back to a moment like that? Um, I can't remember exactly the year, but I think it was in 87 when I played a tournament in Sweden. It might have been 88. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, which was uh, run by Jürgen Sandman. And, uh, yeah, I played there and I, Jim Rempe was there. No, I'm not sure. I'm not, no, I not no, I have to correct myself. It was not Jim Rempe. I think uh, Mike Siegel and Nick Varner were there from the US. Um, and some, you know, European top players. And uh, so I, I played an okay event. I'm not 100% sure how far I actually went into the event. But uh, my current sponsor, that is actually... Um, yeah, sponsoring me since the year 87 came to me and introduced himself to me and, and offered me a, well, I shouldn't say a sponsorship, but offered me to help me out. And uh, so that was basically the first time that I felt, hmm, I, I must have impressed him somehow. Otherwise, he, he wouldn't have stepped up to me and and, and, and offered me a deal. And uh, and. You know, till today, he's still sponsoring me. He's still helping me out. And that's something I think very unusual in, in, in any business, I would say. So, Rob, one thing that's important to me and one of the reasons I'm doing this is, you know, oftentimes we see pool players at their worst, right? They've struggled in a match and maybe sometimes even through a fit. And so one of the things I want to do is kind of promote the players that I talk to and you know, show the, the brighter side and, and, you know, when they're not at their worst. But the problem that I have with you is that you always look the same. So whatever the score in a match, you know, I've had, I've even had people on the podcast that have commented that if you look at Ralph Suquet and the score is eight to one and you're looking over at his table, you can't tell if he's winning eight to one or losing eight to one. Why is that? Like, is that purposeful? And where did you get that from? Um, well, I, I didn't practice it, but somehow this is part of my life, of my lifestyle and the way that I am as a person. And I try not to show too many emotions. And um, that's basically, I think, very helpful for my game of pool. Because uh, showing emotions in the match uh, might be helpful, but it might also be bad for your game because it it could strengthen your opponents when you show like bad emotions. You know, if if you show that you are unhappy, that you're um, yeah not really uh, in in a good mood, and uh, and that's something that I. Yeah, that, that's actually part of, of my life. I, I never really trained myself to do that. I think it's just my my nature. That's that's the way I am, and uh, that's also something that I tell my students if I have time to to, to give lessons. That uh, showing emotions is is usually bad, no no matter how. Um, of course, it's better to to show good emotions because then you can maybe impress your your opponent but uh, but if you show no emotions then you probably gonna um, make your opponent think why is he not showing any emotions he's, he's playing bad he's down seven zero seven one whatever but he's still uh, not showing any emotions so and and by doing that 
I make him already thinking about me. Maybe I'm not saying it's it's always the case, but it might be helpful to disturb his game, and maybe then he he makes that mistake that I'm waiting for to finally catch a gear and and come back into the get into the match. Yeah, that's so interesting, and I think you're right about that because I know when I've played a player that doesn't show emotion at all and they're not playing well. You know, I expect such a negative reaction out of them. And when I don't get it, I almost have this feeling in my mind like, wow, this person must be really good. They're not even upset at all. They're, they're so mm -hmm. confident they're going to come back in the match. And I think, I think you're onto something there. And so you mentioned your students. Uh, I'm curious, uh, tell me about, are you, are you doing a lot of teaching now? And, uh, you know, how many students you're working with, that kind of thing? Um, no, I'm actually not uh, giving many lessons because, you know, we still have the lockdown, so I don't really have access to a table. Um, I can play at my, my friend's home now. He just uh, got his own pool table in his new apartment in uh, last November. But I cannot play there every day or I cannot choose, okay, I, I want to go there and play or practice uh, eight hours. So uh, there's absolutely no way. Um, to give lessons right now, except maybe online coaching. But, uh, you know, it, it would be helpful to have a table at, at, at home, which I don't because I just don't have the space for, for my own table. And, uh, yeah, we still have a lockdown. All the, the clubs are closed. So it's uh, I'm happy enough that I can practice two, three times a week, to be honest. You know, so I can somehow, you know, stay in stroke. But uh, other than that, I, you know, really have to wait until – everything opens up again, but that would mean that uh, probably the, the regular tournament scene will start also, and then there's no time to give lessons because I'm going to be traveling again all over the world. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your experience through this lockdown. In the United States, we have different rules and regulations for different states. So Florida, mm -hmm. Texas, you know, there's been a lot of pool being played in those states. But then there's other states like California that's been completely locked down. I just commentated a match recently with Chris Robinson from California against Danny Olson from South Dakota. And Danny won that match pretty handily. And I think one of the factors in that is the fact that Chris Robinson really hasn't had much time to practice. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> is that Chris Robinson hasn't had much time to practice because California has been locked down. So what's it been like in Germany and how are you trying to make sure that you're ready once the tournament scene starts back up? Well, as I said, you know, I, I can only practice as much as, you know, my, my friend allows it to. And um, so uh, I, I just try to stay in shape. I'm, I'm a, I'm a runner, I'm a jogger, so at least from from this uh, point of view, I'll, I should be ready. But when it comes to hitting balls, uh, I mean, you know, we are now in a lockdown for a year. I mean, my, my last really official competition was in March in Las Vegas last year, even though I, I played two events in, in Switzerland last year in like June and, and August. But... Uh, Apart from that, you know, we had a few online events like the like the one pool, the Predator One pool uh, that is based in uh, in uh, Spain. But it's a totally different game. It's totally offense, and obviously your opponents are playing in their home somewhere. So, and it's uh, yeah, there is no defense play. It's only aggressive, and you know you got to make balls. There's no safety play and uh, no tactics. And so it's, it's a, such a different game that it, you cannot really compare it. So it, it's really hard to, to stay in, in the tournament mood, so to speak. And uh, I guess I have to start all over again once everything opens up again. You know, um, I can only practice, but I guess uh, I need a few tournaments, a few normal, regular events to get back in, in that stroke because uh, it's, it's a different kind of pressure when you just play on your own somewhere in, in, the, in the basement or when you are in a, in a, in a regular arena with 20, 30 other pros around. And uh, so it's, it's a totally different ball game then. 
So you mentioned that you're a runner. I'm curious uh, in terms of, that's one thing I've noticed with European players and American players, and this is a generalization, but it seems like the European players are really into fitness, uh, taking good care of their bodies, uh, eating well, that type of thing. Uh, does does your running and exercise program, does that really help you as a player? I think it does. I mean, I mean, you, you can see all the youngsters nowadays. Uh, I mean, I remember when, when I was younger, I was still smoking and uh, I never even dreamed of uh, running or, or cycling or whatever or doing any kind of fitness. You know? I, mean, I used to play soccer myself when I was younger, but it's, at one point I had to decide do I play soccer or pool because both games or both matches were at the same time. So I, I had to choose. I chose pool. And uh, and since then, I didn't really do much fitness. Did you all. make the right choice, I'm, Ralph? <laughs> if you had well, to go back? If, um, with, with all the titles I won, yes, definitely. <laughs> I don't think I would have become a world champion in, in soccer. I mean, you never know, but probably not. And um, money-wise, I don't know. You know, I mean, I see players nowadays, they play in the fifth division. They definitely make more money than than I do in playing pool. So it's, you never know if it was the, the right decision or not. But coming back to the fitness, um, yeah, it, it definitely helps. I mean, I, I started running at age 35, actually too late, but still at a, at a, yeah, at an age where you can, you know, still get your body in, in good shape again. I mean, I always say it's, it's never too late, you know, you just have to do it. And uh, yeah, it definitely helps you because uh, it's, especially especially when you get older, you know, it's, it's so much harder to stay focused and concentrated when you reach a certain age. And then, you know, being physically fit definitely helps. There's no doubt. And when you look at all the youngsters, Nowadays, they all do fitness. Everyone does something different. One guy goes swimming, the other guy runs, the other guy rides the bike or they do everything or lift weights. I mean, you know, whatever makes you happy, whatever is, is fun to do, just do it. You know, no, no matter what it is, as long as you keep your body, you know, in, in some way in a good shape you're definitely going to benefit from it once you get older. So the fitness part, obviously that's a lifestyle choice. Do you have any other hobbies or anything that you do outside of pool? One thing I'm really curious about is when I talk to players and I find out what their hobbies or interests are and I find out that like Alex Pagulian loves to read and he recommends books and things like that. I'm just curious, do you have any other hobbies outside of pool? Um, well, I consider running one of my hobbies, obviously. And uh, and as we already talked before the interview, I'm a big uh, football or soccer fan, big fan of Borussia Mönchengladbach, also a member of the club. And uh, many years ago, I actually had three season tickets, but the fact that I live about yeah, 350 miles away, from their from their base in Mönchengladbach, uh, it, it got really too difficult to to watch more matches or games, and uh, therefore at one point I I gave all tickets back, uh, which I kind of uh, now when I think about it, um, uh, it was a bad decision. I should have kept one because uh, now they have a limit to thirty thousand uh, season tickets every year and there is a huge waiting list and mm. I'm on, now I'm back on the waiting list, but it's probably going to take another 10 years before, <laughs> before I would be able to, to get a ticket again. You know, I mean, I'll be able to, to watch some single matches here and there, but usually when you, or when I'm traveling around, you know, with, with, the, with all the tournaments, then there's actually no time. So it's, it's probably easier to watch them, uh, play away at Bayern Munich, for example, because it's only like yeah, 50 miles away from my home, mm. and it's and the stadium is much bigger, so it's it's probably easier to get tickets there through eBay or any other third-party seller than uh, yeah, trying to get a, a ticket for the for the home game. 
So Ralph, when, when the country's not in lockdown and you're competing in tournaments, can you take us through your practice regimen? Uh, I talked with Fedor Gorst recently. He's got like a written schedule of things that he does every day. I'm just curious to see your approach to practice. Um, I don't really have a fixed schedule. You know, I, I do different things, but I, I don't do them by the book or so. I mean, w whatever comes next for the tournament is my priority. Let's say if there's a 10-ball tournament, I'm obviously going to practice more 10-ball, practice the break. Um, all the other, or I mean, there's only one other rotation game that I play, which is 9-ball, and... Uh, which is basically the same game, but obviously with a different break. So whatever game is on, I, I practice uh, that particular break. Um, other than that, um, of course, I try to you know work on, on on the break in general. Also, we have, sometimes we have eight ball events. Then um, I'm working on kick shots. I I work on bang shots. I work on. Uh, Safety, obviously, which is uh, a very important part. I mentioned kicking already, getting out of the safety and uh, trying to work on, you know, different rail systems because, you know, so often you you, you are you seem to be so locked that you, that you need to come come up with a good solution. So, I'm, uh, you know, a friend of mine showed me a couple of systems. Uh, then in the US, some guy showed me. The system ones and and the rest is basically, I I you know, I try to work on it myself and, and try to you know, try things out and, and and see if it works and then go from there. You know, that's basically something I do. And I also do drills. Obviously, we we have a, a German coach that feeds us with uh, lots of drills. Um, normally, we see each other three four times a year. Have a basically a, a, a national team camp for a, for a whole weekend, which is obviously right now not the case, but, uh, but he still sends us uh, drills that we should work on and try to, you know, not only improve our game, but also try to uh, work on our basics again, because sometimes when you, when you move around too much or if you don't really have a serious competition like right now, you, you may practice and, and you may do something wrong and implement something bad into your system. And to try to get this uh, out of your system again, you know, you need to reset the, the system again and, and try to start with the basics and work on the technique again. Well, I was talking to a good friend of mine over in the United States. His name's Molina Mike. He's a pool insider. He's got tons of Facebook fans, and he just knows a lot about pool. And so sometimes before I do an interview, I say, hey, Molina, I'm about to interview Ralph Suquet. You know, what are your thoughts uh, about a good question to ask? And he said something that really stuck with me, and I wanted to see if this is something that you practice. He said, I've never seen somebody who's better at rolling shots in, like hitting soft shots where you have to roll the cue ball. Maybe you're stuck on the top rail and you got a long shot and you just got to mm -hmm. roll it in. And I'm curious, because uh, I agree with him. I, I Once he said that, I was like, you're right. I, You know, Ralph is incredible at those shots. Is that something that you really take time and practice? To be honest, no. <laughs> this is probably the, the thing that I... I practice the least, you know, I mean, I do know that I'm quite good at these rolling shots or rolling balls, but, uh, and I obviously I, you know, they come up here and there when, when I practice, but it's not something that I do like hundred shots a day or whatever, you know, it's, it's basically, you have to trust the table, which is very important. You know, if, if the table rolls off, then forget about it. You know, it's, it's useless. You're going to be frustrated because you're going to miss, maybe 70% of, of all the slow roll shots. But uh, yeah, I kind of, I just feel those shots. It's it's in my system. I, I never really practice that particular shot. But I know that I'm quite good at it, yeah. <laughs> the other thing that Mike mentioned is how has he been so consistent for so many years? Uh, what do you attribute that consistency to? 
To be honest, I don't know. Probably if I would know, I wouldn't let you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I mean, I guess it's it's the hunger and it's... Uh, I'm, I'm never really satisfied with my game, with myself. There's always... I mean, my goal always has been to play a perfect game, a perfect match. For some reason, I don't know if I actually have played a perfect match yet. I would say probably not. Maybe it happened because before someone recorded it, but uh, just out of my memory, I would say probably not. And my goal still is to play a perfect match where you absolutely make no mistake whatsoever. Of course, when you count the break shots in, then it's it's really hard because you can hit the break perfect. You can park widely, everything looks perfect. Then comes another ball, kicks it in or kicks it to a bad situation and you can do nothing. You have to play a push or, or whatever, or maybe you even scratch. So there goes your thousand. Um, but besides that, other from that, I, I try to just play perfect all the time. And then this is something that I'm really, yeah, this is, this is my drive. And that's maybe a reason why I'm so successful and, and so, yeah, that this is my drive. And that, that might be the reason why I am the way I am. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, I love it when there's this, uh, mentality about not being results oriented, but really being about playing the game at its highest level. And it seems like mm -hmm. the players that try to attain that are the ones that end up having the most success and, and winning the most events. And, and you've certainly won a ton of events throughout your career. Uh, I love your backdrop there. And so I want to give you a second <laughs> to talk about your sponsors and anything that you're doing mm -hmm. in the billiards industry. Um, so go ahead. Yeah. I mean, if, as you can see on my background here, you see all my sponsors I mean, on the, on the top left, you see dynamic tables, which is actually kind of a new sponsor. It's not that new anymore, but it feels like new because, you know, we, we are in a lockdown for a year and, uh, and this is the, the main sponsor of the European tour. And um, they they built a good solid table. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to have them on board. Underneath there on the left side, you have the fight group. This is my first sponsor that I mentioned before near Hamburg. Um, they are sponsoring me since 87. So this is a, a wholesale company outside of Hamburg um, that are, they have a good network worldwide. They used to have a, an office in the United States as well, but uh, that office was closed down several years ago. Obviously then you have Aramid Balls, best balls in the business. I don't think I have to, to introduce them anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know, 80 or 98% of all events are played on or played with Aramid Balls. Then uh, you have Simona's cloth, the, the best cloth in the business, in my opinion. Um, I've been working with them since 91 also. So that's another very long relationship. And then you see below them Predator or to the, to the top right, Predator Qs. Um, I've been with Predator since 2007, but actually got my first full playing queue just a month ago. Really? I always used, yeah, I always used to play with a different butts, but uh, used a predator shaft or even the shaft uh, on, on my break queue. But now I have complete equipment from Predator, and they obviously uh, changed the, the whole playing business with with their equipment because before Predator came along. Uh, Nobody even knows something about low deflection cues or low deflection shafts. So they're constantly, you know, trying to improve their their stuff. And uh, it's, I mean, it's just amazing how much effort they they put into our sports. And uh, and besides that, they also sponsor like it feels like ninety five percent of of the events around. You know. Yeah, they're doing a lot. Uh, what 
if if yeah. I could stop you real quick, what shaft are you currently using from Predator? I'm <clears throat> excuse me. I'm playing the three fourteen three, but it's uh, customized. It's it's usually trimmed down. I mean, normally it's uh, twelve point seven five, but usually I play mine somewhere around. I would say between twelve two and eleven eight. It, it depends on. I've I've tried the Rebu shaft. I've tried all three of them: the eleven eight, the uh, twelve four, and the twelve nine. But for some reason, I'm not 100% happy with it. Sometimes it's the it's the sound that that drives me crazy because it has obviously a different sound than than a wood shaft. But sometimes it's also just the feel. I'm still one of the old school players that does not use a glove. So that's that's probably the reason why I'm not really 100% happy with it. As I said, I tried it. I tried to use it in, in events. I even played in the China Open with it. But I think in, in the second or third round, I switched back to my 314-3 chef. So <laughs> it's, it just feels more natural. Maybe if I would use a glove, things would be different. But uh, also... The glove is not really something that that suits me, and uh, that's why, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to stick to to the three fourteen three, or maybe I don't know if they have a new product in the in the, in the pipeline. Maybe we're talking three fourteen four at some point. I don't know, but this is only guessing right now. Yeah, and obviously the DBU, which is the German Billiard Union, the German Billiard Federation. They are also a sponsor since a few years that they are sending us to the European tour and to world and world championship and, and European championships. And without them, being a professional player would just be impossible because the prize money is still unfortunately not big enough to just make a living. Uh, from from the prize money. In fact, when I look back 20, 25 years ago, the prize money was the same or maybe even higher, but the competition was way less. You know, I mean, you had less stronger players and uh, so it was a lot easier to actually win and make money with the sport. Nowadays, you need to be in the top five all the time to maybe make enough money surviving as a professional player and most people probably know i'm not a gambler i'm, I'm not a, a money player and that might be the reason i mean there <clears throat> there are definitely players or other players around that make a ton of money but they gamble and gambling was never really a part of my life for whatever reason so ralph i want to follow up about dbu uh are you saying that that federation in Germany helps to uh, send German players to world championships and other events? Yes. They, I think they started doing it three or four years ago. I mean, it's, it actually took many, many years before they changed their minds because before that, uh, they never helped. But uh, yeah, several years, it might have been five years now already. They, uh, they got a little more money from the government and they actually used it to promote their top players. It's not like they're going to send out uh, five or six players to the big events. It's usually limited to two or three male players and two or three female players. So you need to be in the, yeah, in, in the top rank uh, status, so to speak, in order to be well, in order to benefit from the Federation's uh, support, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool, though. And, you know, it would be neat if the United States did something like that where they had this, you know, fund where they could send a few players to tournaments mm -hmm. because, you know, it's a problem all over the world, like you said, with prize funds and the cost of travel. You know, oftentimes yeah. you're, you're paying, you really need to win the tournament or finish in the top three to have a profitable trip. 
And so mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to see more governments step up and, and kind of support federations that would send players to tournaments. It would be kind of interesting. Shifting gears a little bit, I'm curious, uh, who would you say was your biggest rival from your pool career? Um, it's probably Francisco Bustamante, because I still have a quite a bad record against him. And he used to live in Germany for many, many years. So we, we played almost every week somewhere in Germany. And um, yeah, for many, many years, I really had a tough time beating him. I mean, he cost me so much money, <laughs> so to speak. Not, not gambling, but, you know, as, as mentioned, I mean, I finished so many times second, third, or, you know, when, we, when, it, when it happens that we uh, played in earlier rounds that, uh, yeah, I would, I would call him probably my, my biggest rival, even though I, I caught up, I would say, over the last, yeah, five to ten years. But, but still, I, I have a negative record against him. Yeah, but certainly nothing to be ashamed of. He's world world-class player. Yeah, so, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, you've won so many titles, a couple world championships, a U.S. Open, three Derby City nine balls. Uh, let's see, a gold medal at the World Games. Um, what have you won? The what is it? The um, the Whirlpool Masters, like six times or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Out of all those victories you've had, and even the ones I didn't name, uh, is there a vic victory that stands out as like your your most crowning achievement? It's, it's really hard to, to take one out. I mean, I, I won the World 8-ball title. I won the World 9-ball title. All the Moscone Cups were special. Yeah, All I the forgot World to mention those. Were special. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But I, I think the one that pops out a little bit was the gold medal at the World Games because it's an event that only happens every four years. It's an event where you gather around with... I don't know, 40 different other sports. And to win that gold medal in Taiwan, in, in a big pool country, so to speak, and against Yang Ching Chun in the finals um, was, yeah, something special for many reasons. First of all, it was a rematch of the finals in 2001. We, we were in the finals of the World Games in 2001 in Akita, Japan. I didn't have my best match there and he beat me quite, yeah, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was 11-4 or something. But I definitely took revenge in Kaohsiung in 2009 and it was uh, his home city in Kaohsiung. We played in front of a packed house with 2,500 spectators. Um, the whole German delegation from all the other sports were there as well because it was the last sport, the last discipline that was played for the whole World Games. And yeah, just to take, I shouldn't say revenge, but just to, to win the title there. My wife was there, the German coach obviously was there. And uh, yeah, it was just a, a different atmosphere that's really hard to, to reproduce to a regular pool event. You know, and uh, before the, the, the match, uh, one of the delegates told me that if I, if I would win the gold medal, that I'm going to carry the German flag for the closing ceremony into the stadium. And wow. the stadium fits like 35,000 people. Um, so that maybe was an extra boost for me as well. But unfortunately, um, the match, not, not the match itself, but the whole procedure after the match, the, the medal ceremony, interviews, this and that. Uh, our arena was a little bit outside of Kaohsiung, so we had to, to take a bus uh, that brought us back to the hotel. And then from there, we had to go to the stadium. So we actually came too late. The opening, uh, the, the closing cer ceremony was already ongoing. Oh. And I, I actually had to, to run to, to be on time. But, and for that reason, someone else already had to take the flag and, and carry the German flag. So that was the, the sad part about it. But if you, know, if you could or if you would give me the choice carrying the flag or winning gold, I definitely take the gold medal. And so it's, it's okay. 
I, I could live with it, even though I was a little upset at the beginning, but at the end, I said, yeah, don't, don't even think about it. You know, you, yeah. you, you walk into the stadium with 35,000 people, you have your gold medal around your neck. So, you know, th there might be other possibilities for, for similar things to, that will come up. And uh, so it, it, it was okay. That's but that's definitely the, the moment or this event that, that sticks out completely, definitely. That's a great story, Ralph. I really appreciate you sharing that. And, you know, I'm sorry you didn't get to carry the flag in. Uh, but That's I'm okay. left, <laughs> yeah, I'm left thinking it's a good thing you're a runner because you might not have caught up. You might not even have been able to make it to the final <laughs> ceremonies. But, you know, coming off of that story uh, and, and, you know, I just can't imagine what that must have felt like playing in front of all the other athletes, you know, who probably didn't really understand pole or just knew it from a basic level and watching you compete at the highest level, that must have been an amazing feeling. And so turning from that amazing story and amazing feeling, what was your most crushing defeat in your pole career? Here again, there are a lot actually. And um, it's not really one standing out, but one big defeat or one big thing that I could think of was when I lost in the 2006 World Nine Ball Finals when I played Rory Alcano in Manila in the Philippines. Again, similar situation, packed house, not that many players or not, not that many spectators. I don't know exactly, maybe a thousand, maybe 1200. I don't know, maybe only 800. I can't really say it, but uh, I played probably one of the best events ever when up to the finals. I, I played a great semifinal against a Taiwanese player, Fu, with a great battle when it was hill hill. And uh, I mean, it's, it was just unbelievable how good I played throughout the whole event. But then in the finals, I'm not saying everything fell apart, but I just couldn't get my break working and, and everything was so nothing went my way in the finals. So, and, and Ronnie Alcado actually didn't play that well throughout the whole event, but started playing better in the semifinals when we started uh, yeah, using a, a funny break shot with, uh, yeah, he, he drew the cue ball on, on his break shot back to the, to the not to the head rail but to the to the to the side rail basically into the kitchen and, and drew the cue ball two three rails with a very yeah I would say medium soft break hmm. something that I probably couldn't even do even if I would practice it because it's such a, a weird stroke for a break shot yeah but it's it worked for him and and he ran most of his Rex and, and I just broke the way I did in, in the whole tournament and just couldn't get going. Even though I made balls quite often, but I, I never had a shot on the lowest ball. And uh, and that was the main key that I, yeah, had probably my best event ever, but but couldn't actually fulfill the, the, the dream of winning my second nine ball title. Yeah, and you know, pool is such a funny game. I've been playing for 40 years, not nearly at your level, but there's just some days where, like you said, you play the whole tournament, you play perfect, and you get to the finals and you just don't play well. You know, and other times where it's kind of like Ronnie, where you have that tournament where you just start off and you barely squeak by a match or two, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden you start catching a rhythm, catching a gear, get a feel for a certain break like that. So, I mean, yeah. I, I just can't imagine doing that at the world championship level. That must have been heartbreaking. So you've mentioned, yeah, yeah you, you mentioned uh, that uh, I've, I've heard in the past that eight ball is your favorite game and you're, you've won the world championships at eight ball. I'm curious, uh, eight ball is my favorite game too. I'm curious why eight ball is your favorite game. To be honest, I, I don't really know why. I guess it's because it was the first game that I started playing, that I learned the game. Because uh, when I started, there was nothing else than eight ball. And it was so-called last pocket eight ball. And I mean, we had so many different rules over the years that I can't even 
remember all the different rules. But uh, yeah, April was the game that I, that I started playing. And uh, it has more tactics involved. I mean, back in the days, it was like, or let me rephrase it, nowadays, when you play April, you, you break, you make a ball, you still have an open table and can choose which, uh, you know, which balls you, you like to play, the stripes or the solids. Back in the days, if you made a solid on the break, you had the solids. If you made both colors, then you could still choose. But if you made three stripes, and and, and uh, then you had to play the stripes. And, and sometimes the layout for the stripes was so bad that you that you had no chance to run out. And that's when the, the tactic battle started. And I always liked those those tactic battles on the because there was also no ball in hand on the foul. You only had ball in hand behind the line and you, you could only shoot balls outside the kitchen, obviously. So it was way more of, of a tactic battle in, in April than in obviously any other game. When they changed the rules with you know ball in hand and you know making it more aggressive and and, and more media like, so to speak, uh, I'm not saying I'm, I kind of lost interest for April, but the game became completely different. I still consider it to be my favorite game, but uh, when you play a one or two events a year, it's, it's really hard to, um, to, to, yeah, to stay in, in, good, in, in good shape in the game because you, you actually need to play the game more often to, to see the patterns right away and, and to, to make it look like it's super easy. Because April, it's it's a really, really nice game, but can also be a very brutal game. Yeah, and you're right. You kind of have to be playing it to be in that right thought process to yeah, correct, be able yeah. to look at, a, yeah, look at a rack and say, oh, this is the way I'm going to attack it. So, yeah, I can appreciate that. So, Ralph, I do this thing. It's called Speed Pool. It's a little segment in the podcast. And... I didn't talk to you. I didn't prep you for this. Uh, so <laughs> let me know if you're comfortable with this. But what I do is I give you a player's name and you have to respond with the first word that you can think of about that player. Okay. Okay. I'll yeah. try. And no compound words, you know, no uh, yeah, more than one word. So let's see if, if you can do this. And I tried to pick some players that I thought you might know uh, or have had experience with. Uh, you ready? Yep. Okay. Efren Reyes. Magician. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thorsten Holman. One word is hard. Um, it is hard, right? <laughs> strong. Strong. I like it. Niels Feyen. Team player. Okay, we'll we'll accept that one. It was two words. Hmm. <laughs> uh, Joshua Filler. Talent. Francisco Bustamante. Enemy. Enemy. F friend and enemy. <laughs> friend and enemy. I love that. Can we go back to um, Thorsten? You said strong right mm -hmm. tell, tell us why yes. tell us what you meant by that um well uh, look at his body shape i mean he works out he looks so strong so solid um that was actually the, the first thing that that came in mind you know just by visualizing him and uh, and it's hard to try to you know get get one word for for a player, you know, it's it's easier to maybe get a get a whole sentence than you know that would be a little easier. But uh, that's why I said strong. Yeah, I'm curious uh, with Thorsten. Have you guys spent a lot of time together over the years? Competed against each other a lot? I'm I'm just curious with you guys both being German. Um, of course, over the years we we spent lots of times. Uh, a lot of time together at, at events. You know, we we partnered up in the World Cup of Pool several times. We actually won the event in 2011. Uh, finished uh, second uh, two years before that in 2009 when we lost a heartbreaker against Team Filipino, Efren Reyes Bustamani in, in the finals. 
Um, in Germany, actually, we didn't spend that much time together because, uh, yeah, obviously we, we live in different cities and, and he moved to the States. I can't even remember when, but long time ago. So we basically, you know, saw each other at events anywhere in the US or in Asia. And uh, yeah, when when time allows it, we, we hang out, we have dinner together and, and you know, just, just spend time together. And uh, now that he also is in the, in the German national squad again, then uh, we see each other when we have our, our uh, national squad weekends, which obviously didn't happen now for a whole year. But uh, so I, I get to see him more often in Germany now as well. And you mentioned talent with Joshua Filler. Have we seen a player that young with that much talent? I mean, can you... Can you think of anybody else that's had that much talent? I mean, this guy's really doing things that I've never seen before. I haven't seen a player with more talent, to be honest. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of talented players. One to mention is Thomas Engert, also a great straight ball player that's ran 491 himself on a nine-foot table. Obviously, it was not, not obviously, but it, unfortunately, it was not recorded, so... So it's, uh, but uh, he had some witnesses that uh, saw him running that uh, many balls. So, and, and he he was a, a great talent as well. Unfortunately, he he didn't stop playing, but he stopped playing competitions. I believe already eight to ten years ago. You know, he just was sick enough of traveling around. He he never really traveled as much as uh, I do or Thorsten or Joshua or Oliver when he was still competing big time or Ralph Eckert or, you know, I could name more, more other or more German players. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, so, yeah, of course, I mean, you see some talents around, but usually you don't see them very long because for some reason they lose interest or they, they, leave their their path and then do something else and then you you never go you never see him back in in the pool scene you know and, and joshua is different there i mean he, he started also at a young age like most of the other top-notch players nowadays and he also started playing on the on the euro tour as at a young age so he you know he, he always had people around him helping him and, and motivating him so and, that definitely helped him, and yeah, and, and he's, in my opinion, by far the, the most talented player that I have seen. But there, there might be someone else around that I haven't seen yet. Yeah, obviously, yeah. yeah. There, there seems to be a lot of like I think Fedor Gorst, another very talented young player. There's, there's a lot of them popping up right now, and it's kind of scary, <laughs> you know, how good they are. Yeah. So, uh, would you like to try for another Moscone Cup? Or have have those days kind of passed? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's still one of my goals. And uh, I was very close uh, in 2019. I basically was, I already had one foot in the team until the very last event, the last Euro Tour we, we had to play in Austria. And, uh, but unfortunately, I had my worst event throughout the year there. Um, yeah, I just didn't feel good. So I had a little problem in my back before I even went there. So I had to see uh, a chiropractor in, in uh, Klagenfurt, actually one of the therapists that uh, works with Jasmine Ushan as well. So he, he helped me a little bit, but obviously he didn't really get me fit enough to, you know, to, to feel really comfortable comfortable and, and and well enough so i i played a terrible event there and yeah unfortunately for me uh, alex kazakis passed me there he won the event and surpassed me in the rankings and obviously by winning it uh, the deserved his spot in the in the european team that year last year of course you know most people probably seen the Moscone Cup. Uh, we had no events to actually qualify. We had a few events and uh, 
Fedor Gorst as the reigning world champion uh, was the only one that was uh, basically um, qualified for, for the Moscone and all the other players were hand-picked, which uh, I totally understand. And uh, as soon as I knew that this was the procedure they they're going to use, I, I named the team right away. As soon as I knew that that was the way they're going to select the team. And I, I probably would have chosen the same team myself, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was quite a powerhouse, and as great of a player as you are and a number of other Europeans that didn't get selected, it's hard to argue with a team that did get selected because it was just, I mean, everywhere you turned, it was yep. amazing pool players. So you mentioned Moscone being one of your goals from here. I'm just curious, do you have other specific goals from here uh, in terms of things you want to accomplish in your pool career? Yes, I definitely want to win the World Championships also one more time. Um, my goal was already in 2020 to win the World Ten Ball title. I was in good form when I was in Vegas, uh, the tournament right before the World Championship that obviously did not happen anymore. I finished fourth, so I was in, in good shape, uh, played well, and I was basically ready for the, for the World Ten Ball in Vegas last year. And uh, Then the lockdown came, and we had to leave Vegas, otherwise I probably would have stayed in the U.S. for several months. And uh, yeah, since then, everything just went downhill. So now I'm, I don't even know where I'm at right now because as I said, the, the few online events that I played, I didn't really perform good at all because it's such a different, uh, yeah, such a different game. And it's, an, 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 I shouldn't say I'm not motivated, but it's it's different. I, I practice as much as I could, but it's it's, it's just a, a different format, and I'm not really adapted to this kind of format. But I'm not giving up on it. Um, and, and we'll compete in more online events until hopefully the lockdown will be over soon and uh, regular events will start uh, yeah, popping up again. Well, Ralph, I... I... I'm excited to see the regular events again and to see you out there. I think one of your problems might be that I think you really like the battle aspect of facing off against another opponent, playing defense on them and kicking balls. And, you know, it's just like you said, when you're playing the ghost, when you're playing these offensive tournaments, you miss that aspect of it. And you're yeah. such a fierce competitor. I think that might play a role in you not being able to get up as much for one of these matches, but I'm sure you'll crack through and, and uh, do very well in, in some of those events coming up. When you get to the United States, when everything opens back up and you come out to Las Vegas or something, I'm really excited to meet you in person. So I want to make sure that we do that. And I want to thank you Absolutely. for, yeah, I want to thank you for your time today and answering so many questions. I really appreciate it. And I want to give you one last chance to, to say anything that you want to your fans or anybody that's watching out there. Well, what can I say? You know, hopefully we see each other again. The sooner the better. I'm really looking forward, you know, when events are happening again, especially in Vegas, one of my favorite cities in the world. I always liked it there and I always liked the atmosphere there, even though I'm not a gambler, you know. Uh, I still love Vegas with all the shows, with all the, the lights and, and everything. So um, I'm really looking forward to see you guys again. And uh, I'm also an ambassador for, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, the turtle season in Germany. You may have seen it, which is a, uh, yeah, it's a different format that is uh, played in Germany. And uh, maybe you check tell it out on, on Facebook. What it, What's it all about, Ralph? Tell us. Um, a player, his name is, is Holger. His nickname is The Turtle. So he basically, um, you can challenge him in long races, race to 30, um, played. He did several seasons. Season one was straight ball. Season two was um, nine ball. Season three was 10 ball. And now later on in the year, season four will come out. And I'm, I'm, I will be the ambassador for season four. So um, he will play against players in his called Turtle Base. 
and uh, you have to give him weight. So you, you know, you can start giving him, let's say, seven games raised to 30, but he only accepts uh, the best eight or the highest eight wages. So I played in the 10 ball in season three and I gave him uh, 18 games ahead in, in a race to 30 and I just barely beat him 30 to 29 but I, I had a, I had to come with a with a big uh, comeback because he had me like I don't know 28 to 14 or so so it was a really tough fight that lasted like six plus hours and uh, but unfortunately I didn't win because there were other players that uh, gave him one game more on the wire and and won by a bigger margin. Oh, wow. I mean, my my German, or well, not my German, but my teammate Mario Hay from my German club BSV Dachau, he beat him uh, thirty to twenty four, and he he won the the turtle season three. Really, and this is, is this... something that I. So you should check it out on you know turtle season on Facebook. He he does a, a great job, and uh, it's it's as I said, it's a different format, and and season four will be. Again, difference. You know, for the first time, he's going to move out of his turtle base, and he has basically qualifiers plates in Austria, in Switzerland, and in a different city in Germany as well. And two winners out of all the qualifiers will then come to the to the final event, where those eight players will play eight different turtles with different uh, wages and uh, yeah and whoever wins there moves on to the quarterfinals and then those eight players play in, in a regular tournament style to win uh, 5,000 euros for first place wow that so, sounds uh, that sounds really cool yeah, Ralph. It's, 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 it's a really interesting thing and uh, he's gonna or they are will come out with an app also for uh, for the whole event. They have some other events included. One it's called the Versus and one it's called the Open. And uh, hopefully in about a month or so, the app will be ready to be you know downloaded on. Yeah, I think it's going to be on the Apple Store and and on the on the Google Store. And uh, yeah, then you know you can check it out. And there will be some drills also implemented into the app it's going to be a cool app and i'm really happy to be the ambassador for, for season four and, and the whole new projects coming up in the future you know ralph i think that type of thing is what we need in pool right we need creativity and folks doing something different to get people interested in this game that we love right we'd watch pool all the time but what about people who you know could be fans of pool or spectators of pool that right now just aren't that into it. And it sounds like this type of creativity is something that could really help kind of the sport, you know? Uh, one, one thing I forgot to ask you, I want to ask you now, and we'll kind of close it out with this. Uh, one of the goals of this podcast is for up and coming players to listen to folks like you who've been there and get mm -hmm. some advice uh, if you could give like one nugget of advice to an up and coming player, uh, it could be mental game, it could be practice regimen, it could be, you know, how they take care of their bodies. What would that one piece mm -hmm. of advice be? And we'll kind of close it with that. One piece is always hard, but um, I would say to sum it up, just try to be yourself. Try not to copy a person or another player just pick good things from different players mix them into your own game into your own style and create your own style and it's definitely just be yourself don't don't act like like an actor at the pool table because eventually it's it, it's gonna hurt you it's, it's always better if you just be yourself and and show your personality also at the table <laughs> 